Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, I hope you're all doing fantastic. So, today I have a treat for you. Today we are going to be talking about engine failures after takeoff. Now, this is a briefing video that is supposed to be used together with my Mentor Aviation app. So, um, if you haven't gotten it already, then get it and get the engine failure playlist because this briefing video is dedicated to that playlist. So. What I'll be focusing on today is not the nitty-gritty ATPL stuff surrounding um, engine failures after takeoff, but the actual handling and the actual procedure to follow. So, um, in case when we're taking off, uh, basically if any kind of engine failure happens prior to V1, which is our decision speed, then we would reject the takeoff. And if you want to see how a rejected takeoff is done, then have a look at my Mentor 360 app where I demonstrated that. If the engine failure occurs after V1, then we are dedicated to the takeoff. And that is because there's not enough runway left to do a safe stop on the runway. And it's actually safer to bring the aircraft into the air, sort everything out using checklists, and then come in and have the full runway length in order to stop after the landing. Okay. So how do we actually do it? Well, the pilot flying obviously is focusing on handling the aircraft. So when, if the engine failure occurs just after V1, what's going to happen is that it's going to be a massive loss of thrust on one side, which will, since we have full thrust on one side and not on the other, the, the running engine is going to try to push the aircraft towards the side of the dead engine, which means that the pilot flying is going to have to enter quite a lot of rudder in order to keep themselves safe down the center line. Okay, so that's the first thing that the, that the pilot flying will notice, that the aircraft is starting to yaw. The pilot monitoring can call out either engine failure or engine fire. Engine the failure. reason that we separate those two is that with an engine failure, we, uh, we are going to have that immediate jaw. But with an engine fire, we might actually have some residual thrust from the burning engine. So the handling characteristics might be slightly different. Right, but the, the pilot monitoring is not calling out which engine it is. It's not, we are not concentrating on telling what kind of failure it is. Just engine failure, engine fire. Right, rotation. In a normal rotation where you have two engines, you would have two engines that are undermounted, which means the engines are sitting under the, uh, the wings. They will actually help you to rotate. If you have an engine failure, you now only have one engine who's helping you to rotate, which means that it's actually a little bit heavier to rotate the, the, um, uh, the aircraft. And you should be rotating with a slightly slower rotation rate. In the case of a two-engine rotation, we rotate at about two degrees per second. With one engine, it's one and a half degree per second. So just slightly, slightly slower than you would do normally. Okay. So pilot flying is now pushing the rudder, keeping the center line, rotating the aircraft up. At around eight, nine degrees or so, what happens, and this happens in a two-engine takeoff as well, is that the backwash from the wings will hit the stabilizer and we will come into what's called the dead band, which means that we need to, it changes the, um, the angle of attack slightly back here and we need to add a bit more back pressure. And that's going to be the same happening during an engine failure. It's just going to be even more important to pull through because if you do not add back pressure, the aircraft will just rotate up to eight to nine degrees approximately and stay there. And the aircraft might, depending on weight, get airborne and then touch down again. Now, we do not want that. We want a continuous rotation up to a target of about 12 and a half degrees. So if this happens to you, rudder in, rotate and continue and force yourself to rotate the aircraft all the way up to those 12 and a half degrees. Now, when you have achieved that, and you have achieved a safe climb. The pilot flying will call for gear up and the pilot monitoring must really carefully check that you have A, the correct attitude, B, that all the other parameters are correct and C, that the altimeter is starting to tick up. All those three have to be through before you actually select the gear up. So pilot flying calls gear up, pilot monitoring verifies all of this, selects the gear up, okay. Now, below 400 feet, we do not do anything else, okay? There will be loads of master caution warnings popping up. 
the pilot monitoring just cancels them. As they come, you just cancel them. You do not verify what they are, just cancel them. And the reason for that is that below 400 feet, the only thing that we should be focusing on as pilots is to get the aircraft climbing safely away from the ground. Above 400 feet, the pilot flying will call state the malfunction. And they will also call for a roll mode. So in most cases, that would be heading select at this point. So, the pilot monitoring will then start to identify the failure. And the way to do this is that you would call out if you've heard a large bang, for example, or anything that's abnormal. And then you would start from the top of the engine instruments, work your way down instrument by instrument. So in the case here that we're gonna, we are going to talk about today, we would have a little bit of N1 that is running down slowly. We have EGT and there's an engine fail alert on the EGT. We have positive N2 and there's no engine exceedances. And then you go all the way down here and you verify that there's no engine fire and no engine overheat. Okay. If this is the case, the pilot monitoring will say we have an engine failure, engine number two. The pilot flying will then have a quick look to make sure that the pilot monitoring hasn't missed something and say, I agree, no memory items. Now, if we would have, for example, a complete um, severe damage of the fan, for example, the fan has just stopped rotating, we would have no N1, or maybe no N2, or anything like that. Any extreme exceedance on our engine instrumentations might be caused to believe that it's a severe damage. And if that's the case, then there are something called memory items to be done. Memory items are checklist items that we need to do by memory not referring to checklist, but something that we need to do by memory because they are critical items. And in this case, there's no memory items to be done. Now, if there are no memory items, this is a good point to call ATC. So pilot monitoring might be calling ATC here or they might delay that depending on what the situation looks like. Remember that we always prioritize flying, navigating and then communicating, okay? Right, so we continue to fly. Up above about 1,000 feet above the aerodrome level, um, we are going to, or the pilot flying is going to call for bug up. This is uh, what we refer to as the MFRA, the minimum flap retraction altitude. So the pilot monitoring will then bug the MCP speed up to the up bug, uh, which is the um, clean speed for the aircraft. We will pitch down, start accelerating the aircraft. Once the aircraft has accelerated above the white bug on the speed tape, we can select flaps one. Once it's accelerated above the one bug on the speed tape, we can um, select flaps up. When the flaps are up and the leading edge light is out, the pilot monitoring will call flaps up, no light. Pilot flying will respond to that with, okay, I need level change, which is the pitch mode to be used and max continuous thrust. Max continuous thrust, um, the engines are not designed to continue to run on takeoff thrust forever. And especially when we've lost one engine, we do not want to lose the other one. So max continuous thrust is a slightly lower thrust setting normally than the takeoff thrust is. Um, and that's the designed uh, thrust that the engine can run on for a very long time. So the pilot monitoring will go into the FMC, select max continuous thrust on the N1 limit page on the CDU, and then reduce the thrust on, uh, on the remaining engine to that value. Now we continue to climb. We have been, uh, we have been assigned an altitude since we told ATC. And when we talk to ATC, by the way, it's going to be either a pan-pan call or a mayday call, depending on how bad the situation is. But we've been assigned an altitude, so we level off at the altitude, which is going to be higher than the minimum safe altitude. And once that happens, just before then actually, the pilot flying can engage the autopilot. Level off, when everything is under control, the pilot flying will call for, I want the engine failure and shutdown, non-normal checklist, I have the radio. Non-normal checklist will be found in the QRH, the quick re uh, reference handbook. And the reason that the pilot flying takes the radio as well as flying at this point is because the autopilot is engaged and we want the pilot monitoring to be focusing only 
on reading and doing the checklist correctly. So you will see this inside of the, uh, of the instructional video, how that checklist is being, uh, being done by Captain Alex. Um, checklist sequence. So the way to follow the checklist is you want to do the, uh, the emergency checklist first, which in this case is the engine failure shutdown checklist, followed by the recovery checklist, which is or might be, depending on what the engine indications are, the engine in-flight restart. And after that, you can do the after takeoff checklist. Okay. In some cases, you can also do the after takeoff checklist in between the emergency checklist and the recovery checklist, but it's going to be up to the situation. Um, right, so when it comes to talking to the cabin crew, we want to talk to the cabin crew fairly early because we want to get their information. They might have seen or heard or smelled something in the back. But generally speaking, if they haven't called us, they probably haven't heard or smelled anything. Which means that it's better to give, to wait a little bit and, and decide on what to do before we speak to the cabin crew. So we would do, at that point, we would start, you know, when the checklists are completed, the pilots will start talking to each other and we'll start talking. And normally it would be the captain who would ask the first officer, how do you perceive the situation? Okay. Let the first officer outline what the situation looks like. You know, what are the threats here? What are the challenges? In this case, we might have to land with one engine. We might need a longer runway um, and things like this. And the reason the captain asks the first officer is because the captain probably with the higher seniority or the higher experience would probably have an idea of what to do. But we want to ask and pull as much information as we can out of the first officer because in many cases, the first officer will have come up with things that we haven't thought about. So the captain asks the first officer, the first officer tells the captain what the situation is like. Right. Then we gather whatever information we need. So that might be weather information, it might be um, talking to our traffic control and see if we've left something behind on the runway, maybe there's indications of something else there. Um, but any information that we think is very you know, good to have. Based on that information, we will then make a decision on what to do. That might be going back to the um, airport that we just left, or it might be diverting somewhere, or it might be continuing for a while to a better, better suited airport. Once we've done that, once we've decided on what to do, we are then going to execute that plan and continuously evaluate the plan as we go along. But here is where I would contact the cabin crew. So contacting the cabin crew, I would press the cabin attendant call button, take the PA mic up and say, Number one to the flight deck. Number one to the flight deck, and this differs between different airlines, by the way, um, is an emergency call to the cabin crew. Whenever they hear this, all of the cabin crew in the back is going to know that something is coming, is going on, which means that they will store their trolleys, stop their service, and they will go up to the forward galley to get their briefing from their purser. So I would uh, talk to the purser in this case and say, okay, are you ready for a NITS brief? NITS stands for Nature, Intention, Time and Special Procedures. So nature in this case is we've had an engine failure. Intentions is we're going to go back to the airport of departure. Time, we're looking at about 15 to 20 minutes. The time is now and then we would synchronize our watches. And special procedures, I wanted to keep the cabin secure, tell me if there's anything special going on, and there's no need for an SOS demo. SOS demo is something we do when we have a critical failure of some sort and we think that we are going to evacuate after landing. But in the case of a normal engine failure, there should be no problem whatsoever, so there's no need for an SOS demo. <laughs> So after that, we will make a PA to the passengers. Uh, we wouldn't go into too much detail about the actual problem we have, but we would tell them that there is a technical defect and that we are going back to the departure or we are going to um, divert, depending on what we're going to do. And tell them that you know, they will get more information once they get down on the ground and to please listen to the cabin crew's instruction. After that, we will go into preparing for our landing, which is a completely different briefing. So guys, I hope that makes sense. I uh, hope you like this one. As always, bring me your questions. And if you have the app, you can go in and you can chat about this in the chat function. Uh, for now, I hope that you're all having an absolutely fantastic day and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.